It's crazy. 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 I can tell that this video is going to be really hard to film because I'm having problems speaking. Plus, I've only got 15 minutes because I got to pick up my kids from school. <laughs> I really hope you can't hear the road. There's a lot of road noise going on because I live in fucking apparently New York City. Um. Oops, sorry. That was like a core memory being unlocked. Do you remember that episode of Fresh Prince of Bel-Air where Carlton is getting like kicked out of his prep school for cheating because he was doing this? Bitch, that's real. When you're stressed out, there's like a thing where like your neck, it's like that. It just happened to me just now. And that hasn't happened to me since I was a kid. When I was a kid, bitch, I thought I was dying <laughs> because I kept on doing this. And also this. I was such a weird kid. Yeah, I did some crazy shit back then. I had this intense fear for th t these tables. <laughs> Y'all are n like, stop. I, I know you're gonna diagnose me in the comments. Don't. You don't need to do that. I know a lot of y'all love to do that. You love to tell me what ailment I have or, um, what I struggle with. These tables, when I was a kid, I developed an intense, very visceral fear for them because I think I had like a dream where I bashed my head into it repeatedly. Growing up for years, whenever I would see these tables, I would get like a pain in my forehead here. And the only way to fix it was to like rub my head. So on my channel, I've realized I don't really have like a video where I talk about like my favorite, 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 favorite book. I do have like one video that I, I don't think can it's from quite a while ago, but in the video, I just talked about the books that made me love reading. Like, I remember I, I included books that I read in like the sixth grade. And it does not fucking matter what the favorite book of a kid who was afraid of these tables. <laughs> So in this video, I thought I would just make a little, quite a little list of my favorite books currently. Honestly, I'm gonna keep it 100% so real with you. See, I can't speak. I don't really have a favorite any, I don't know. I, I struggle a lot with favorite things. But the way that I kind of went about doing this was these are the books that I, I'm, I plan on rereading or I want to reread or I have any interest in rereading. I really don't return to things ever, ever. Every single movie I've seen, I've seen once. Every single show I've watched, I've watched once. Every single activity I've done, I've done it once. I haven't wiped my ass since I was six or wash my hands. So I feel like it's a good indicator if I have an interest to return to something. It's probably my favorite or one of my favorites. So I have seven books here that I've read and I could, I could see myself returning to them at some point. I recently, last summer, I reread Pachinko. Um, it wasn't a great experience. The first time I read it, it was like the best thing I've ever read. Second time I read it, so the first one is a memoir that I read a few years ago, In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado. I think it's extremely popular. I don't, I don't know. However, this is about her relationship with a woman that was quite abusive. The thing with this book and Carmen Maria Machado, the writing, I read her short story collection, Her Body and Other Parties, which I would also love to return to someday. The way she writes, she, she doesn't write like a normal person. She's not typing on her computer with her little mortal fingers like you and I. What she's doing is she has a kitchen steak knife, a big one, huge. And she's got both of her meaty hands wrapped around the handle of this knife. She's just over her typewriter, she's going, She's an author, but she's not an author like most people are authors. I think that she's an artist and what she creates here as well as here is art. When I was putting this list together last night, I was like, damn, if I'm gonna reread any of these books soon, it's this one. And I, I found an audiobook because the first time I read it, I just read it without an audiobook. but I found an audiobook that is read by her, which I started listening to last night. The next one's Lolita by <gasps> Vladimir Nabokov. Now don't click off just yet. Hear me out. I think the writing is beautiful. The story's obviously fucked up. I love a fucked up story. I love it. And even in like the world of pedophilia literature, <laughs> 
This isn't even the most, like, I think that Tampa by something nutting, that's some crazy shit. Like, that's some fucked up shit. This, honestly, I, I wasn't that unsettled by, and I was very surprised the first time I read it that it wasn't. People just make it out to be, like, awful and extremely dark, which it is, but it's not, I don't know. I even think that like My Dark Vanessa is more dark than this is. What I found from this was it's about a man, Humbert Humbert. He is experiencing hallucinations and he's dealing with mental illness. It's told from his perspective, making him an unreliable narrator. And I would love to return back to it with the perception that I have of it now. Because when I first read it, I was like, oh, this is gonna be so bad like this is gonna be crazy the next one is a book that i recently read this is the first one in a series it's probably the best sci-fi series i've ever read i feel like i read quite a bit of fantasy and sci-fi but this is the only one that's made it on the list i finished it a few days ago it's the first one in a series that i don't know what it's called <laughs> what is the series called i don't know this is the three-body problem by Sishin liu This is a mix of like Chinese history, um, aliens, science. The science goes crazy in this one. I was never a fan of physics ever. I, I like, I haven't even dipped my toes into that shit. Even in high school, I was not taking physics. This sent me on like such, like, I, the second I finished it, I immediately started looking at videos, like reviews for this book, theories, <laughs> videos on like the TED Talk channel and science channels about particle physics and like the Fermi paradox and cosmic sociology. I listened to like podcasts on <laughs> dark matter. It like has me questioning whether I should go back to school for like particle physics, <laughs> which is like, I'm not gonna do because I would fail. Like. Like, I could, I'm not gonna, but like, I could. The problem with this book is I don't want to say anything about it. It doesn't even have a fucking synopsis on it. And I think that is that, like, good. I'm glad that there was not a synopsis on this because going into it, knowing nothing was such a good experience because it is such an expansive narrative, but the science and the ideas that are being proposed that are backed by science, I think what is especially interesting is it's real. It's real. Like Alpha Centauri. I don't, I don't want to like get into it. We have like a one star system, the sun, we're rotating around it. There's such thing as a two star system. So because of their gravitational pull, they're, they're doing this. Do you get that? But the second, when you add a third star, if you were to take this and add a third star, oh, oh, it goes fucking crazy. Look at this. This is what happens when you add a third star into that system. These aliens, I don't want to say, like, I hate saying stuff about this because I think you should read it without knowing this. But these aliens live on a planet in this star system, Alpha Centauri, which is real. And there's stable eras and chaotic eras. Like me, in my, cha in my chaotic era. <laughs> me right now, in my chaotic era, era. This might be crazy to say, but I think that it's time for you to face it. Saying you're chaotic is the same as saying that you're quirky. Listen, I'm not saying it, you're saying it, and that's fine, like, you do you and shit, but in, like, 10 years, I'm gonna be able to look back and say I never said that I was chaotic, in a serious way. But basically, a stable era is sometimes these stars will orbit in a way, you know, in a stable way. But chaotic eras is when they are going all crazy and circling each other. But I'll just say it's not the best time for a civilization on a planet to grow during a chaotic era because it's not, it's not stable and it will. It will do a thing. It's so good. Although I haven't read the whole series. I mean, the second I finished it, it was the first time I've ever finished a book and be like, damn, I need to turn this shit like to the front again and go over everything he just said one more time. Just one more time. The next one is Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. I did a whole video about reading this book because I read her other book, her shorter book, Gathering Moss, and I was so deeply affected by it. Let me read her more popular one, her magnum opus, as they may say, and dedicate an entire video to it. Robin Wall 
Kimmerer is an ecologist. She's also indigenous. I was introduced to Robin Wall Kimmerer on the podcast Ologies, which I love so much. Actually, the podcast that I was talking about that involved dark matter that I listened to after reading The Three Body Problem was an Ologies podcast. This is like, it's part memoir, part science. Robin Wall Kimmerer is an incredible writer, such an unbelievable writer. She's so gratuitous, kind, and so extremely likable. It says it on the front cover. It's about indigenous wisdom, scientific knowledge, and the teaching of plants. So it's a mix of like history, mainly history involving indigenous peoples in America. She talks about residential schools, ecology. She talks about plants and environments and how humans interact with them, how we interact with them now versus how indigenous peoples once interacted with them. Spoiler alert, indigenous peoples interacted with it a lot, a, a, a bit, maybe just a tad bit more uh, ethically, <laughs> but it just, it just feels like a warm hug. I feel like in the future, I definitely will return to it. It's essays, so even just reading a couple of the essays at a time, just to feel some sense of security, <laughs> I could definitely see myself doing that. The next one is a book that I read in high school. This was like for English class. So I don't know why my teacher had us read this, but Slaughterhouse-Five by Kurt Vonnegut. I remember reading it. I remember loving it. This is like, it, I, would it be science? I guess it's science fiction. So I guess I was lying before. I feel like I read quite a bit of fantasy and sci-fi, but this is the only one that's made it on the list. It's like science fiction, surrealism. There is like a different planet and aliens. It's basically about a man. For him, time is not linear. Time is... Relative. What? and he just jumps throughout his life. I think there's like a tragic experience. I think he was in like World War II. It has something to do with the Dresden bombing. And then I think that sparks something in his brain that makes it so that his mind is just kind of going from one time period in his life to the other and he has no control over it. I remember there's like one time period of his life where he's like a zoo animal on a different planet in space. And then there's also like a, isn't there like a porn star? Like a famous porn star is in the cage with him? I don't know. See, it's clearly it's been long enough that I can definitely reread this book. And the last two books I have, these are the books that when people do ask me, what's, what's your favorite, what's, what's your favorite, favorite book? These two books are the ones that I interchangeably use. The first one is The Secret History by Donna Tartt. This is just good. This is the book that sparked dark academia in like the 80s or 90s, early 90s, I think. For me, at least, it's pure escapism. I think escaping into this, I don't know, I, I maybe I'm just like a masochist, but the idea of being in like a rainy, horrible New England university, studying an awful language, not awful, studying something that I feel like I would hate, but it's pretentious, so maybe I would love it. With a friend group of truly, truly toxic, cantankerous assholes. I don't know, that's just like really appealing to me. <laughs> I think also the way it's written too. The main character, what the fuck is his name? He's not even the main character. The, the, the character who the book is from the perspective of, I don't even remember his name because he's hardly in it. But I think that the way that it's written from his perspective, it's kind of easy to put yourself into his shoes a little bit. So when I was reading it, I was like, damn, like, I'm literally in this friend group right now. Like we're covering our tracks of our friend we killed. But yeah, it starts out, you find out that Bunny was murdered, just one of their friends. And then it kind of just goes, what's it called? M medius res medius when it starts in the middle and then it backtracks and goes forward to the end that's what happens the atmosphere it's the atmosphere that makes this book so incredible the writing as well it's just a good book i think it's objectively just like a good book also not really because there also is a lot of superfluous just like stupid shit one of my favorite things that an author can do in a book is include bullshit that they just are passionate about i love that i don't know why i think it's probably something that the majority of people would not like but for me, when it's very obvious that an author is just passionate about some random anecdotal history time period or like an esoteric academia thing, I don't fucking know. Just infusing that into their books, even though it has nothing to do with the narrative or the characters. And then the last one is a book that I don't like to recommend. I don't think that anyone should read this book. And when you see what book it is, you will understand why. But A Little Life by Hanya Yanagihara. <laughs> It, it's, it's like torture porn. 
Yes. Hanya Yanagihara went into this book being like, I want to destroy lives and write the saddest thing in the world with some of the most incredible writing. She did what she had to do. She did what she wanted to do. Like she wanted to make a book about trauma and that is so fucking just torturous. And even the way that it's structured, you know, the first like 200 pages, she develops these characters in a way that makes you care for them and then completely destroys them in the most brutal ways possible. And I think that 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 is awesome. This is the kind of book that in like 30 years, when I'm like 80, I guess I'm 50 right now. In 30 years, I will return to this. Not anytime soon. It, it, this was sleep paralysis <laughs> because as much as I wanted to stop reading it, I just couldn't. So those are the seven, I don't know, are they my favorite books? I don't know. I don't know. Like, yeah, I guess. But also like Pachinko, I thought that that was my favorite book. And then I reread it and I said, this is not my favorite book. But do you need to enjoy something more than once in order for it to be your favorite thing? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think what we've learned is that I'm the, be <laughs> I'm the beauty standard. I am what you should be thriving to be because like, I'm not mentally ill at all. <laughs> Stop diagnosing me in the comments. Oh my God. Okay, me. <laughs> Me literally having hallucinations out my window while adamantly defending my lack of neuroses. Oh, fuck you, okay? I don't know what that is. There's a goblin in my backyard. Okay, bye. Like, God, just please let me goon again. <laughs>